Before I arrived in this world, my parents built a homestead cabin in the Mojave Desert. The desert became part of me before I was born. Maybe that's why it seems like a dream sometimes, like old Super 8 movies exist out of time. Hi, I'm Steve Brown. As a journalist, historian, and someone who wants to better understand the land I call home, I'm taking an incredible road trip to get to know the land, the beauty, and the people of the real deserts of the Southwest. I hope you'll join me on this epic quest. The following are proud supporters of PBS programming. Ridgecrest, a base camp for a California experience. Located on the other side of California, east of the Sierras. Lake Havasu City, more than 60 miles of navigable waterways. Located in West Arizona and home of the London Bridge. La Casa del Zorro, a desert retreat located in Borrego Springs and surrounded by Anza Borrego State Park. Palm Springs, California. Desert playground for Hollywood movie stars, celebrities, and pop stars since the advent of the silent movie. Elvis had a home here, as did Cary Grant, Elizabeth Taylor, Bob Hope, and Frank Sinatra, and Marilyn Monroe got her career started on a photo shoot here in 1947. You can stroll down Palm Canyon Drive today and still see signs of Hollywood's presence here with the Walk of Stars. Even Cheetah has his own star. And there's a statue of Sonny Bono who became Palm Springs mayor and went on to serve in Congress. And if you look, you'll find one of Lucille Ball too. She and Desi had history here. Desi Arnaz reputedly won a lot in the Thunderbird Country Club in a poker game. Hollywood still enjoys its relationship with this quaint desert city. Stars like Leonardo DiCaprio, Halle Berry, Gwen Stefani, and others can be found vacationing here, while Robert Downey Jr., well... The Palm Springs International Film Festival helps keep the ties alive. It's become one of the leading film festivals in the country in the process. Not only is the city known for its Hollywood ties, but also for its mid-century modern architecture, its world-class museums, and vistas that make it one of the most beautiful and interesting cities in California. Palm-lined streets, the immense presence of Mount San Jacinto nearby, blue skies and warm desert nights still greet visitors who fly or drive into the city, the famous and the regular folks who come to Palm Springs to golf, dine, shop, and relax. But Palm Springs didn't begin as a Hollywood playground. It has a rich history that stretches back thousands of years. The Cahuilla people have called this land home for millennia, and they still do. Much of the modern day city of Palm Springs is built on leased Indian land owned by the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. Named after the hot springs that still soothe the tired traveler today, the Agua Caliente have endured first the Spanish and then the Americans. I love Palm Springs and all it has to offer, but I want to learn about the people who were here before the city, the Agua Caliente, and I know just where to start. The Agua Caliente are one of nine bands of Cahuilla Indians who have lived in the desert, canyons, and mountains of the Palm Springs area for well over a thousand years. Preserving the tribe's history and traditional culture is an important part of ensuring it continues to play a role for future generations. Michael Hammond is executive director of the Agua Caliente Cultural Museum, a great place to begin learning more about the original inhabitants of Palm Springs. Well, the Agua Caliente Cultural Museum was founded in 1991, moved into this building in downtown Palm Springs. And our mission statement basically says that we preserve and interpret the culture and heritage of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians and other native peoples. And that phrase, other native peoples, allows us to do an exhibition like we're standing in right now, which is an exhibition on stereotypes. How important is it that you have 
a program to support cultural pres preservation for a tribe? I think it's very important. Uh, I, I think it's important for this nation to have history museums and cultural museums so we understand the first inhabitants of the land that, that we now all share together. Uh, the story of the Agua Caliente is one of the most fascinating ones in Indian country. They have been the leaders in numerous court cases, uh, establishing 99-year leases. Uh, they've uh, overcome adversity, uh, people trying to take away the Indian canyons, be it real estate brokers, be it national park. Uh, trying to take those, and for the reason that the tribe was not using the canyons to their full economic potential. To tribal people, the canyons are sacred. They are homes that the three clans that form the Agua Caliente Band, the three clans' homes, ancestral homes, were in those canyons. Okay. Now, what kind of stereotypes do Native Americans face these days? All kinds of stereotypes. Uh, and I think, you know, Native Americans are not alone in stereotypes. Uh, the, any ethnicity has a stereotype about it from others who are looking at that particular ethnicity. Hollywood has portrayed Indians in the most outrageous fashion. And a lot of the things we have on this uh, exhibition of stereotypes have to do with Hollywood and their portrayal of Pocahontas, uh, the first film, feature film of Pocahontas. Uh, Raquel Welch played <laughs> Pocahontas. Uh, that's not typical. And we have a, a short video that uh, we play that shows some clips from some of these Hollywood movies. We also have in this exhibition on stereotypes, everyone groups Indians together. And if you look around on the wall here, you see the individual names of 560 something federally recognized tribes and federally recognized Alaskan villages. These represent 500 or so separate languages, separate belief systems, separate ways of organization, and how they go about uh, relating to the federal government. They're all different. Okay, so they don't all wear feather headdresses, ride on horseback, and, and uh, sleep in teepees. No, in fact, this exhibition is entitled, Where are the Teepees? And that is the second most frequently asked question at this museum. The first being, are there still Indians here? And when we answer in the affirmative, the next question is, where are there teepees? Really? So yes, honestly, that is, that is a true statement. Where are there teepees? And it's because of Hollywood, because of seeing the Plains Indians in full headdress and buckskin and living in teepees and, and riding horses, that that stereotype that Hollywood has projected has been enforced on belief systems and people look at other tribes that way. But tribes are as different as, um, I was talking to a reporter a while back from Europe and she said, why aren't the tribes just all one? And I said, why isn't the European Union one language? <laughs> and one belief system. Why do you allow individual countries like Germany and France to exist? She was taken aback because she hadn't really thought of it that way. Most people haven't. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the tribes all being different. Now the Agua Caliente are part of the Cahuilla. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about Cahuilla life? In history. Yeah. Cahuilla is basically people who share the same language system. So that there were mountain Cahuilla, pass Cahuilla, and desert Cahuilla in long ago. And there still are. There are still, you know, Los Coyotes up in the mountains, uh, 
Kawea band of Kawea Indians, there's Torres Martinez down valley, there's Morongo in the pass, there's Agua Caliente. Uh, there are nine bands of Kawea. But they were a group that shared the same language. Uh, most Kawea uh, have two moieties, uh, moieties being a spiritual figure, a moiety of the bobcats and the coyotes, and only a bobcat could marry a coyote, and coyotes could only marry bobcats. This kept lineages straight, it kept clan systems straight, but it, the clans ultimately came together, which meant giving up the sovereignty of the clan, which is amazing that they did this, but they did it to form a tribe, the Awa Caliente, in order to unite in opposition to what the federal government was trying to do. And they felt through strength of greater numbers, they would succeed. So not only were they uh, leaders with property ownership, but also didn't they uh, get the Bureau of Indian Affairs to extend leases. They did. That was the all-woman tribal council. All right. uh, the first all-woman tribal council in the entire country. Five women, and they went up and they walked the halls of Congress and literally buttonholed congressional people and said, here in Palm Springs, we have land, and it's valuable land, but we can only extend five-year leases, 10-year leases, 15-year leases, and no outside monies want to invest in that. So these women were very successful in getting Congress to pass a law that allowed tribal nations throughout the entire country to have 99-year leases if they wished. Which allowed for development. Which allowed for and development. the city of Palm Springs. Really. City of Palm Springs, absolutely. If there's a place to get a feel for what Palm Springs was like when the Agua Caliente were the sole residents of this area, it's the Indian Canyons. I'm meeting Tribal Council Vice Chair Larry Olinger and Andreas Canyon. Larry's first term on the Tribal Council was in 1961, so he's the perfect person to provide some perspective on the tribe's history as well as its future. I want to know what Larry considers to be the biggest accomplishments the Agua Caliente have seen during his lifetime. I think probably the greatest accomplishment is, is sovereignty, okay. to be recognized as a sovereign nation. Um, I think probably the next step would be the uh, mutual agreement, the land use agreements that we have with the city of Palm Springs, Cathedral City, Rancho Mirage in the Riverside County. Probably after that would be the gaming uh, and the uh, purchase of the spa hotel and the construction of the spa hotel, uh, not the spa hotel, but the uh, spa casino and the Agua Caliente casino. Uh, the tribe does a lot of charitable giving and is involved with local communities quite a bit, no? We do a tremendous amount of charity work, yes. And we're very happy to do so, as a matter of fact. I mean, we feel that uh, you have to give to your community. Uh, and I think it's paid off. I, I think this, the residents know that, uh, that we're a very charitable giving group. Okay. And, and sovereignty doesn't mean apart from the community. No, no. Uh, we're we're in the we're in the city of Palm Springs and Rancho Mirage and and uh, Cathedral City and Riverside County, and uh, we're just a part of that group. And uh, I mean, you know, there a lot of people ask us, well, why do you do so much, you know, and why do you to do, do you fight so much for your rights and stuff and 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 that, and because we we're here, we were here originally, and we're going to be here when everybody else is gone, if that happens, mm -hmm. you know. But I mean, our ancestors, as you can see, look in this canyon. 
that's why they, that's why the canyons are so sacred to us, is that they were born here, they were raised here, and they died here. And each one of these canyons, and each one of the the, the floors of these canyons, they're very very sacred to us, and we have to preserve them. And you're doing a good job of it. Speak that louder, please. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a very good job of it. What about cultural preservation and historical preservation and passing that on to um, the tribe's youth? Well, I think uh, any group uh, is interested in their cultural preservation and their history. And uh, you can't look at today, I don't believe anyway, without looking at your history. Uh, I'm so thankful, uh, to be honest with you, to be able to look at the history, look where I came from, look where this tribe came from, and what we have today. And uh, it's been a great accomplishment. It really has. A lot of people really don't know our history. And uh, so they really don't appreciate it. And what, what kind of future do you want to see for the young people of the tribe? For the tribe? Mm -hmm. I think with the prosperity that we have with the tribe that uh, uh, their future education is, is so much, uh, means so much to the tribe that uh, a lot of the elders weren't able to really go on to higher education and stuff. And now the younger, the younger members can. And uh, that's just very important to us. It sounds, it as, sounds... As a matter of fact, it's so important we have, we have different programs to encourage them to go into higher education. We will pay for their education. Mm -hmm. Well, they're the, they're the tribe's future. No? Absolutely, it is a tribe's future. You see some good leaders coming up? I do. I definitely do. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, I am too. Yeah, I think that's pretty exciting. Right. All right. Now, as the young people go forward and the young leaders of the tribe go forward,